what does it take to transform health throughout all our neighborhoods here in LA County? Well, we have to look at health differently. We need to recognize living conditions as health conditions, from hunger to homelessness. And that's why as the nation's largest community-inspired health plan, LA Care is more than just a card in your pocket. We're elevating health care here in the City of Angels. LA Care, for all of LA. LACare.org. Good evening. Talk all things American Horror Story. Before we jump into it, we just have so many questions that keep popping up every time the show ends. Who are we really fearing on this show? Every single character on this show is crazy. Even the baby. Even the baby is exhibiting signs of being crazy. Is it Winter and Kai we should be afraid of? Is it Ally and Ivy? Is there Sun? Oh, who, who are these clowns in the costumes and the masks? Each week it gets more and more twisted. And where is Twisty the Clown? Well, with all those questions being said, welcome to Relapse, the official Bad Culture Radio after show for American Horror Story Cult. I'm your host, Giandra LaBeouf, creator of Bad Culture TV, and your host each and every week to talk all things American Horror Story Cult, and it just gets more and more haunting every week. Every week we watch, we see, just when you think you've seen every liberal person's fear played out on TV, we see a different layer and a different layer and a different layer of fear being broadcast to the masses, courtesy of American Horror Story Cult. With that being said, let's just jump right into it. This week's episode, episode three of of this season, is entitled The Neighbors from Hell. And there's some neighbors from hell here, but maybe it's not the neighbors they think it is. It could be some neighbors we haven't even met yet. Tonight, the episode kicks off with a couple discussing their greatest fear, which is being trapped into something, ferrotrophobia. I'm sure I didn't spell that correctly in my notes, but I definitely want to look that up afterwards because I'm not sure. I don't have that fear. I might be a little bit claustrophobic, but I've never been locked into anything, so I don't have that fear. So we start off with that, and our good friends, the clowns, they make their appearance in the episode again. They force the couple into some coffins and seal them in. What a horrible, horrible, horrible way to die. Looking at some of the characters, we got some clowns. I don't know what some of these clowns. One looks like a demon, demon clowns. Just looking at all these weird array of clowny scary characters makes me just want to go and research some clowns because I'm kind of scared of clowns too and this season is not helping me any and then we see the pan the next seat we see we see Allie across the street crying from her window as if she's having a purview of what's happening with these clowns locking up the couple in the coffin but it's not the case as we know from last week She shot her poor co-worker who was just, or her staff person, that was just coming over to her to assist her. Her Allie's girlfriend, Ivy, sent him over there to take her some soup and some essentials and some batteries to help her cope through the blackout. And what does he get in return? A couple hot slugs in his his chest. And that's the end from him. The real, you know, it's so interesting to see these things taking place on this episode when we are seeing so many of these stories taking place in the media where you see unarmed people, people of color being shot, by the way, Black Lives Matter, uh, seeing so many unarmed people being shot and killed in the streets. And what is crazy is what happens afterwards when she is visiting, uh, she's visited by the police to discuss what happened on her doorstep and Ivy has returned home. The police are going out of their way to convince her that, She was standing her ground since they do live in Florida. Remember, this takes place in Florida. And her girlfriend co-signs what the policeman is saying by saying they could have perceived ISIS as a threat. I don't know if ISIS is popping up at random white people's door, but okay, we'll go with it since this is a season about fears. And they are going out of their way to convince her that she was not at fault. And she really wasn't. Maybe her girlfriend should have warned her that the poor man was coming over. Why didn't her girlfriend warn her? 
and tell her he was coming over when she knew she was unnerved. Got you looking at Ivy a little bit sideways. And then another thing. So now we've got him shot on the block. The Asian couple the first week were shot on the block. At what point do you say to yourself, there are too many people dying on this block, and it's not the hood. My God, we've had somebody die on the block every single week. After the first couple killings, I got to go. Because one is a freak accident. Two killings, that's too, too many, and it's time to go. And it's time to find somebody else, someplace, someplace else to live where people are not getting killed every week on the block. So as they try to transition and they try to transition back into normal life, Allie and Ivy go over to their butchery restaurant, the little business that they own, and find protesters outside of the restaurant. I don't know. Ivy, every time I think Ivy is okay, something she does something or she does some type of reaction that makes me feel like she's on the side of the killer clown who may or may not include Kai and Winter. I don't know. I have a feeling they're not even the ones in the clown suit. They might be the people who are going to help everybody, but we'll get there at some point in the season. Wow, just so it was so much to digest this episode with the fact that Allie killed a Hispanic unarmed male. She was called a lesbian George Zimmerman. Ouch. That's really, really harsh. But, you know, Stand Your Ground is taking place in Florida, and that's uh, the paradox that they came up with. Kai instead, who she's been fearing all this time, shows up at her window of the car with his purple hair and tells her that she's really brave, and he applauds her for defending herself. Kai is the last person that I want to receive kudos from on it, it, by any means. And the fact that she's receptive to his kudos is pretty telling about it. But at this point, she's so desperate for any type of, uh, any type of uh, gratification or anybody just seeing her point of view and having her side because she feels like she's not getting that from her girlfriend. Her son is too young to really support her, but I don't know. She's going to take it anywhere she can get it. So we're flashback. She goes back to the house to evade the protesters and have some semblance of peace. And the Gabers, a.k.a. Harrison and Meadow, come on over in sombreros and ask her, how does it feel to exercise your white privilege? Wearing sombreros to general to symbolize the generalization or tell her that's the way she perceives all Hispanic people. Gabers are a wild pair. They're really not both gay. The husband's gay, as we both know, but I just like calling them the Gabers because it's easier to remember than Harrison and Meadow. So after they go home, it gets us to think again. Should we fear Allie? Should we fear Ivy? Should we fear both of them? Should we fear the Gabers? Every single person is suspect. And as they go home and then Allie and Ivy try to resume their night, we get the first look at a chemical truck that's passing by with a kind of creepy green iridescent light spraying some type of chemical all over the neighborhood. What exactly are they trying to exterminate? One thing is for sure, it works on the birds, or at least we think it works on the birds because they're crows, dead crows all over the backyard the next day. Really creepy and menacing. It's even more creepier that they're all dead because in past horror films like The Birds and by Alfred Hitchcock, we see so many instances where black crows and black birds symbolize fear and death and the fact that these death forewarning birds are already dead in the backyard on the lawn. And why are there so many birds dead in the backyard? Does anybody know why all these birds are dead? I don't know. But they're back there, they're dead, and it's scary. And in just that short amount of time, they come back in the house and there's a big fat white man jacking off in their living room. What the hell? What the hell? That was disgusting. And the fact that he was answering an ad, who placed the ad in the paper? They think it's the Gavers. I think it's Kai. I, well, no, actually, I think it's Winter. It's just, it was too much. It was too much. But, you know, the Gavers say some things to them that makes you think they could have called him over there, but I don't think it was them who did it. He was sent over there because they were searching, because he answered an ad saying that he was a stud. Two lesbians were searching for a stud to, to help them out. They didn't want any Latinos, and that just sounds more like Kai's handiwork than anybody. The fact that they singled out Latinos, I think Kai, with his purple hair, sent them on over there. So we uh, pan over. As we know, Allie has been seeing a therapist all season. Her therapist just seems way too relaxed and way too disconnected 
for what she's telling him. She's talking to him on the phone, trying to make herself calm again, and he's just laid back in the chair listening to her like, please, bitch, get off my phone. I don't have time for this today. He's probably part of the clown sect, too, and they all have a master plan to drive Allie crazy. Or so we think. Maybe we should be afraid of Allie. Allie scares me. I don't want her coming over to my house. So she tries to resume life. She tells her her therapist that she wants to go out there and she wants to talk to the protesters to bring some type of calm and say her piece. He tells her it's a bad idea. She does it anyway. So while she's there and she's immersed in the crowd and the throng of people have trapped her in her car and are circling her car, Crazy Kai comes over and as soon as he walks up, the protesters disseminate. What the hell? Did he pay them? It makes me wonder if he paid them like uh, if you live in Los Angeles and you see all the people outside of Pink's Hot Dogs all the time. I just refuse to believe that Pink's Hot Dogs are all that good and I think they're extras being paid. It makes me wonder if Kai did the same kind of thing with these protesters that are outside her car. They go back home and the Gabers have brought little Ozzy a guinea pig. The couple doesn't like it. Allie and Ivy have a no pet rule, but they seem pretty comfortable with pet in there. But poor Mr. Guinea didn't last very long because he ends up in the microwave and turns into hamster or guinea pig soup. Very much like fatal attraction. Gross. I just want to know who cleans the microwave after. Do you even clean the microwave or do you just throw it away and, and get another one? It would seem like they wouldn't even have a microwave because they cook all the time. But they had one. Mr. Guinea went in it, and Mr. Guinea will not live to see another episode of American Horror Story Cult. Uh, Harrison and Meadow, we start seeing them in their own private confessional pinky twist moments with Kai, where they're talking about their deepest fears. The funniest fear that was revealed during these intimate sessions with the Gabers and Kai was Meadow saying that she fears that Ramona, I think she said, from Real Housewives in New York has a drinking problem to which Kai slapped the shit out of her. That is the funniest thing tonight. I really, really laughed out loud to see him just give her a good Ike Turner for being more invested in in a reality TV program than what was happening in the real world. That was pretty funny. But what was really telling was the fact that Harrison says that he hates that he married his fag hag, a.k.a. Beard, a.k.a. insert your favorite term for categorizing a straight woman that acts as a gay man's front so that he can live in the closet in real life. But he said that's his deepest fear, and he wanted her dead. Fast forwarding to, well, we'll pause right there. We know what happens at the conclusion if, as you watch the episode. If you watch it tonight, if you're listening to this, you probably already watched the episode, but we'll get back to that in the end. Kai tells Meadow in order to in order to um, really live in the world, she has to make everything someone else's fault. That sounds familiar. I never thought about that. Because if you do project fears and things on other people, then it keeps you from taking accountability from the problems that you have in your life. It's really genius. If something is always someone else's fault, then you don't have any pressure to make any solutions or make things any better. And the person who put that enlightenment in your head ultimately rules your thinking and can curb you to do whatever they want. And we know that that's Kai's whole agenda is to profit over, profit off of people's fears and what they have going on, their inability to think for themselves. So he's already planted the seed in Meadow's head. How did they even get together? Where does Kai live? He seems to pop up where everybody is, and it seems like Kai and uh, it seems like uh, Allie and Ivy and, and Meadow and and Harrison, they live in a pretty nice neighborhood. And so where does Kai live? Are he and Winter brother and sister, do they live in the hood too? Where is their house that they always manage to pop up? Hopefully we'll find that out pretty soon. So going on through the episode, we see the murder face pops up on Allie and Ivy's door. We see it pop up on the Gabriel's door. But who's going to die first? At uh, Allie and Ivy's uh, house, it ended up being Mr. Guinea first. But over at the Gaber's house, we find uh, Harrison covered with blood. But is it really Meadows? Did she really, really die? I don't know. She might be in cahoots with Kai by now. So we move on. Uh, Allie is out in the streets after the police arrive where she sees 
Harrison having a, a fit. The police are there. He's screaming that he didn't do anything to her. He was asleep, and he found himself covered with blood. He wasn't responsible because he was asleep. In the midst of watching everything take place, the chemical warfare truck comes by again, and she goes racing out to them and asks them, who are you from? Are you from Halliburton? Are you from Monsanto? If you're unfamiliar with these two companies, I suggest you Google them. Monsanto is based down in the south, and they're responsible for dumping tons of chemicals into the Gulf down there, killing off the wildlife down in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, all the Gulf country. And Halliburton is a big, big producer of weapons in the world, weapons of mass destruction. They have bases overseas where American contractors go and work, and they supply things to the military. Other things that are deep fears for people who are liberal because at any time either could be responsible for launching us into another world war. So very slick Ryan Murphy to slip that into the episode. They talk about regrets. And then in the exciting conclusion of tonight's episode, the baby, Ozzy, admits that he took off the parental controls from his computer. I thought Winter took that off when she was putting him on the dark web but at any rate he's off of the nanny control is turned off and his computer is locked into a camera that has been placed into Allie and Ivy's bathroom and if you remember in the previous episode Winter made a pass at Allie when she was at a weak vulnerable moment sitting in the bathtub and gave her a little hand job while she was in the bathtub all of which Ivy sees on the video and she slaps the holy hell out of Allie for cheating on her. Boy, there's a lot of slapping going on in this episode. So while they're arguing and arguing and arguing, they notice that some other things are happening just outside their door. The police show up, and that's when we find Harrison freaking out, and he's being carted away, presumably accused of Meadows' death. And as they return, Ozzy disappears for a brief moment. They go in after him and find blood all over the house. Is it Meadows' blood? Has it been posed there to make it look like Allie killed her? After all, she did threaten him when they went over there. And uh, Mr. Guinea had been microwaved fatal attraction style and said if they kept messing with her and her son, she would kill them. I think it's just too obvious a choice for Allie to kill somebody. I think Winter did it. I think Winter is probably a more fearful person than Kai. But again, we are left with all these questions. Granted, we are only three episodes in, and all of these questions will be answered as the season goes on. But there's a lot of scary things. We see another couple that's been killed. I'm assuming they live on the same block because it's a really nice house, or at least in the general vicinity of the neighborhood. Meadow has disappeared, and Harrison is by himself. She admitted that she was jealous that he had a new friend. Their previous arrangement that was it once a month or once a year, he could go buck wild and do whatever he wanted in his gay lifestyle. But it looks like he, they've got a friend that's coming over and hanging out every time. Am I mistaken with the friend that came over, the cop? I'll have to go back and look again. It just occurred to me that the friend that came over had that kind of bleached, kind of bleachy, blonde, light hair. Was the cop that's investigating the murders? Harrison's new friend. Hmm. I don't know. As I watch the replay after I conclude the show, I'll get an answer to that and I'll address it on next week's show. But we have a week's episode and it looks like a whole bunch of Harry Carey going on. Finality to any of the questions that we have thus far. So we just got to keep watching. So that's it. That's all I got. I still don't know who I should be afraid of. Winter is creepy as all get out. She's like Wednesday from the Adams family, but kind of like a carry kind of murderous thing to her. I don't know. She's scary, but she's probably not even the person that's uh, puppet mastering the whole thing. I think that uh, Ivy Alley's girlfriend is a real puppet master in this thing, and it's a whole setup to bring people down. She's probably not even really lesbian. She's probably just playing the role so they can put this whole elaborate plan in motion. I don't know. Maybe she is the mother of Winter and Kai. Who knows? We'll find out. Sarah Paulson, I like you. I hope you're not the killer because you always make it to the end every season because you are the star on this show. But 
That's all I got for this week's edition of the American Horror Story Cult official after show on Bad Culture Radio. Make sure you keep tuning in each and every week following the new episode on Tuesday nights, roughly at about 8.05. I thank you for listening in. Week one was amazing. Week two was super dope. Super dope. Week three is super lit. I'm excited to watch the show. I can't wait to see what the numbers. You guys are really listening to this show. Thank you. If you want to chat with me, let's keep the conversation going. Hit me up on Twitter at J-E-A-N-D-R-A-L-E-B-E-A-U-F on Twitter. And let's keep the conversation going. Make sure you use the hashtag, hashtag A-H-S cult, so that the showrunners and creators and other fans of American Horror Story can see what you are talking about. And let's see if we can debunk what's happening on this show. Where is Twisty the Clown? They brought him back for one episode, and that was all she wrote. And with that, good night, everybody.